Okay, our next talk is contributed by Bias Incorporation. Uh, they're manufacturers of basically electromodeling software. The talk is Modeling and Analysis of Supported Metal Catalysts by Steve Levin, John Newsom, C.N. Freeman, F.M. Allen, and Tom Mandela. Tom Mandela is in the talk. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, Steve Levin couldn't make it. He's now in the program. Um, He's in Paris at the moment, so it's known as Cincinnati, and we just were in the fourth quarter, and it's an active period, so I'm really happy to, uh, to give you this talk. Uh, I graduated about six months ago with the right of ascent. You might know she visited Cincinnati a couple, how many months ago now? Just like one, it was like Ah, okay. Um, I did some uh, theoretical work on uh, uranium clusters. I'd like to talk a little bit about that because uh, essentially that's where that we study the influence of, of the support on bonding to traditional clusters. Um, when I heard that uh, I was giving this talk last Friday, I thought, well, what shall I do? Um, it's, it's a fundamental catalyst meeting, so it should be digestible for you to just to show you a little bit about what kind of work we do. I won't go into too much detail. I won't tell you, show you too many formulas. Just I show you what kind of systems we study and why we study them. Um, but the first 10 or about 15 minutes, I just want to say some general things about modeling. What you can do with modeling currently. Um, how can modeling help you to improve your uh, design, to improve your catalyst? Or just you design new catalysts, how can you use that? So that's the first um, step, 50 minutes of my talk. I really don't know how long it's going to take. I promise I'll be out here in, at 11 o'clock. But there might be a little break in between. I really don't know. So. Can you people read it on the board? Okay. Uh, I'm just making a vision to do some uh, general scope of categories um, of modeling. Um, well, let's, let's make it nicer if we put this in a, in a graph. It's very popular. Um, what we did is we just um, these are the different categories of modeling you can do, and this is the level of sophistication. Okay, so there are very simple things like just displaying the catalyst on the screen. Um, it's very simple. It can give you a lot of information if you can look at your catalyst, look at the pores. Um, so, what's simple with getting molecules in the pores, see if it fits. A lot of um, functionalities of the catalyst are just caused by simple staring. Uh, for steric reasons, creates a cure and not a cure. So, just by simple visual, visualization, you can already learn a lot about the functionality of the catalyst. Um, what we also consider as kind of simple things is, is characterization. It's um, really easy to calculate in a fraction pattern for um, a periodic construction. It's easy to calculate a X-ray electron nuclear fraction pattern for zeolite. And when you do that, um, you might be able to, to compare that to your experiments. Okay? Um, so, for instance, you build a catalyst in the lab and you build it on the screen and you see, you, sh you just check if the, the fraction patterns match. Okay? If they don't, you can make changes to your structure uh, just to make it fit to your experimental work and just in this way to detect the structure. And there are more intelligent ways to detect it. Um, so called retail <coughs> refinement is able to fit um, you know you have to fit the structure to experimental abstraction better. But it's a very intelligent way to detect the structure of your um, catalyst. <coughs> this category is what we call what if experiments. What what happens if I do the silicon alumina ratio in the CLI, what you do most of what you do often in experimental work. Um, where are my reactive sites in my CLI? Um, 
you can calculate that with these kind of experiments because you, you can do a sort of a simulation and I will talk a little more about that later on. Um, you can create defects in your structure and calculate defect energies or um, calculate what additional reactive sites you get if you replace the silicon by your titanium. Okay? And then finally, well, just on top of level of sophistication, that's the real electronic structure calculation. Um, you study very small models of the system and um, you just look at one step in your reaction, one step in um, functionality of your catalyst. Um, so, well, I have a good example of that later on. So, I'll just want to show you what kind of models you can study with electronic structure calculations. And these are the most well, quite tedious calculations. They can take a long, uh, long time. Maybe it's good to reiterate why people do modeling, not just uh, just themselves to experiments. In modeling, you always observe very well-defined uh, model systems. And at this sense, you don't have any disturbing influences. You're studying exactly that model that you want to study, and there is no environment that um, hides data or whatever what you see in experiments. Um, and I think the way it should be used is, is to guide your development. You can sort of design a catalyst um, on your computer and um, change some things, like I said, change the silicon aluminum ratio and predict some things. And if you think, well, this can be really um, useful to me, then you try to um, uh, do an experiment and check that and learn more about it. But just always keep that link between modeling and experiment. That's, that's important. And in this sense, it, it can really reduce your expense. Uh, it can reduce the expenses for the double direct experiments because a lot of experiments you, don't, you just don't want to do because you see uh, during simulation that they are they are not useful. They don't work. Um, and besides that, calculation can give you additional information. Um, if you want to, just one example. If you if you study the interaction between a small molecule and a surface, you can see which kind of um, molecular orbitals are involved and which not. You can divide it up with symmetry, which of course you can never do with an experiment. Um, just one example of things we do that um, is molecular mechanics, molecular mechanics, uh, dynamics, energy minimization. Um, we always start with specifying a potential model. What, what kind of potentials are involved in my uh, specific material? Um, it depends, is it ionic, is it um, polar, highly polar, polarized like it is zeolite or metal oxide, or is it just an organic molecule? Okay. And well, some kind of interaction you can do is just a simple long interaction, long range interaction, very important in ionic materials. And you just represent that with a term like this. Okay? And you sum that over all neighbors. And there are some intelligent ways to, to make that summation, uh, for instance, the evil summation. Then you have the short range interactions. Um, and I want to divide them in two body terms and three body terms. This is uh, called so called Buckingham potential. It's a repulsive part, and it's an attractive part. Uh, but you can also use Leonard Jones or whatever kind of potential you think fits best to your particular system. And there are so-called three-body terms, uh, which are more important in covalent bonding. For instance, if you if you have three carbon atoms, you want to put some restrictions to this angle because you don't want to do it like this. And if you have three-body terms, it doesn't really matter what this angle is. So that's why you want to apply three body terms and really specifically take this angle in your potential form. Uh, but as I said, that's more important for simulating organic molecules. And the next thing you want to do is fit all these parameters of alpha, rho, c. Um, well, in this summation, of course, you get additional parameters which are related to your structure. You want to fit them 
to either experiments or the first principles, ab initio calculations. You probably want to fit them to bulk values. Okay. Um, about first principles calculations, a little more later. So, what do you do with this kind of uh, simulation? Uh, you can uh, calculate structural properties. For instance, you start with a CLI, you change some silicon for alumina or all the way around, and you want to re optimize your structure because the structure doesn't um, fit anymore to your, to your composition. Okay, so you do an energy minimization to get the optimal structure with the new composition. Uh, but you can also study physical properties, uh, for instance, phase transitions. And in this way, you do a finite temperature calculation, and you can, for instance, study the um, um, transition from, uh, from fluid to, to, uh, to solid or over, or those kind of things. Um, and you can, for instance, study mechanical, mechanical properties, like elastic constant. <laughs> Another type of simulation is, for instance, to study diffusion. If you have an organic molecule in the course of the DOI, you want to know, you want to have information about diffusion collection. Okay, that, that's important for a steric uh, hindrance in zeal lines. Uh, or you might find, uh, want to find favorable sorting sites. I have an example on the slide. Uh, I'll suggest we do a couple of slides now. If somebody can turn the line on, I think it's over there.
Okay, so that, so that's why you can enter these as parameters. The kind of machine you use to find out this to power size. Okay, uh, this is a simulation of silicon NMR, uh, which is very useful if you're working with silicon alumina uh, geologic places, just to see what the local environment of your silicon <coughs> atoms is like. And again, I show you three different uh, graphs, which uh, the blue one is, has got the biggest broadening. Okay, also, again, depending on your kind of situation. And this is a little more. Example of simulation. What we did for this is amorphous um, silicon oxide, and this is uh, crystalline aluminum. Uh, just to mention, that's the support for this platinum silver catalyst. <coughs> and we started out with one layer of platinum silver. mixture of, of atoms and then we ran a simulation uh, just to study the segregation of platinum from the silver and in this way you get a cluster and it turns out that the kind of cluster you get is dependent on the, on the, uh, the kind of support you have because uh, we calculated the diffraction pattern of this cluster okay which is really, really looks more obvious. Okay? And we calculate the infection pattern of this cluster, which is blue one, which looks more obvious too. So what we did afterwards is we, suppose that this one, this one was totally amorphous, subtracted this pattern from this pattern, and what you get then is this purple curve. And then you see some, some interesting things. You see some peaks. And it turns out that you can describe those peaks through uh, reflections of silver uh, 111 and 200. And I admit those peaks are only very minor. But if there are those, if there are peaks like that, you can find them with uh, just a simple, uh, just by playing around uh, like this uh, with windows, windows crash. Example of another simulation. Uh, the question was, what are the, the favorite absorption sites of a ethylene molecule on a platinum silver surface? Okay. Um, well, you can do a lot of things. You can do a calculation on different sites, and you can do a lot of calculations, hundreds or a thousand. But that takes you a long time, and probably you just missed the answer. You should do the right calculation. So, what we did to very Quickly uh, look for the favorite absorption sites to do the simulation. We gave this ethylene molecule an initial velocity to, towards the surface and just followed it. And influenced by all those potentials, it's just bouncing around on the surface. Um, which you, of course, you cannot see in this picture, but you, you should see it on and this is what we measure. Uh, this is the energy of the ethylene of the total system and the distance between the center of the ethylene molecule and the center of those three atoms. And then you see some interesting, interesting things. Um, it, it's a little small, but what you see is roughly like this. You have two minima which is caused by the ethylene bumping between two minima in these three atoms. Because the distance between the CC bar, the CC bar length and the distance between those two minima uh, is different. So it's bumping between those sides and just after a while it just came off the surface. So that's the result of a very good uh, simulation of the behavior of the on this particular surface. Thank you.
system 
and you can calculate the gradients of your system. And when you know the gradients of your system, you can do a step. You can move the atoms and calculate the energy again. And in this way, you can find the energy minimum. So one thing you can do is um, just... Um, well, this is just an example of, of a system you can study. It's a metal cluster, a uranium cluster, it's a very small cluster. That's, that's, that's the model. And we, we calculate the energy of absorption of sulfur. <coughs> um, so with that functional theory, you can calculate the energy of this system, calculate the gradients uh, for this system, and optimize the distance between sulfur and iridium. But why did we do the calculation of sulfur and iridium? It followed up on other studies, um, hydrogen, uh, carbon monoxide, um, which are all important steps in carbon conversion reactions. But the last step was study sulfur, because sulfur is infamous for poisoning a catalyst. So maybe if you understand the mechanism of absorbing to a catalyst, um, you might as well find something to do, to do about it. And the, there were reports that maybe cations in the support could change the absorption property, properties of certain species. Um, and you have both cations, for instance, eolites, of course, um, you know all that. Um, so what we try to do is to set up a model to study the influence of the cation on the absorption of uh, these kinds of species. And what I did was study the absorption, of, study the influence on the absorption of salt. Um, okay, well, this is, it's not a detail, but I won't tell too much about it. Um, you solve the equations for it principally all your electrons, but the inner electrons are not important, it's the core, so you don't want to treat them, um, uh, you don't want to treat them variationally, you really want to freeze them. So effectively for iridium, you take only nine electrons. Um, iridium is a precision metal, so we have 70 electrons, 2s electrons. And that makes it complicated. Nine electrons is quite a lot just before an atom. Sulfur is to be six electrons, and the magnesium ion is ten electrons. Eight electrons. Yeah, eight electrons. And the next thing you have to do is include relativistic effects because because iridium is so heavy, your electrons um, approach the speed of light. And then strange things happen and you have to take really into account your relativistic effects in that. But I said, just don't worry about that, we, we did that. <laughs> uh, it's really this. Um, so as I said, frozen core, and you have to represent the frozen core by some extra potentials in your Hamiltonian term. So let's go to the results. So again, this is the model. And we do very small clusters. It's the question can be, why don't you take 10 clusters? Because 10 atom plus because those clusters are much bigger. Um, well, the first, first answer is that we just don't know how big they are. Okay, so and always in this kind of work you have to take a specific model. And we just start up with four because it also speeds up the calculations. And uh, this calculation is already uh, quite tedious. So we took those models as uh, investigated three different kind of absorption sites. We have a one fold, two fold, and three fold position of the sulfur on the cluster. Now we study the magnesium on the other side of the cluster, the opposite side. And then you can you can ask the next question, why on the opposite side? Why not why not on the just next to it, on this side, this side? And again my answer is it's just a simple model and in these kind of studies you have to restrict yourself to a very simple model and maybe afterwards you can study other positions of the magnesium. And also it's not clear how these particles are really located in your GLI. So, uh, so that's why we just took this model. Uh, okay. And these are some results. 
these are the absorption energies of sulfur on an iridium four cluster without magnesium. And these are the results with with the presence of magnesium. Oh, sorry, it's not this. Let's let's look at the absorption energy first. Um, first thing that you see is that absorption turns out to be very favorable in two pole position because it's the lowest energy. That's one conclusion. Uh, and if you introduce magnesium, it's totally different because the one pole position becomes less favorable and the three pole position uh, becomes very favorable. Let me try to explain why this all happens. This cation polarizes the cluster. So electrons in this bottom region are pulled away. Okay? So the electron repulsion decreases in this region. That's one thing. The other thing is that the interaction that the interaction becomes less favorable because of the positive charge uh, on this side. Okay, so also the interaction becomes less. And those things you have to add up. And then it really depends on the um, the amount of each effect which decreases or increases the bulk energy. Let <coughs> me go back to, <coughs> to these results. We see that that for a threefold geometry. That in the presence of the magnesium bed uh, ion, the uh, interaction, that this is the most favorable position. So the sulfur and the pole position are very close. Um, and we also calculate the bond distance because well, you have to optimize your bond distance to have a realistic, um, just have to, re to have a realistic system. And you see that there is there is quite some contraction this kind of uh, this kind of models. The water position doesn't change uh, too much. But you see it more, more clear if the effect of the cation from the cluster you will calculate a so-called density difference plot. What you do is you subtract from the final electro density the electro density of the isolated atoms. And then you get something like this. With the dash lines, we depict a uh, decrease in electric, in electric density. Okay, the decrease in electric density. And with the solid lines, it's an increase in electric density. So with the presence of, so with the cation, we cause a decrease of electric density on the top of the cluster. And this is a four atom cluster. These are in the play and they're swamp. And you be front of the play and one play the play. Okay? So the net effect of you get I is a decrease in electric density in this region, in the bonding region. And this is causing all the effects I just mentioned.
Well, let's look at PC. Um, and let's, let's just concentrate on the solid lines because the dashed lines are in the present of each line. I, I want to have a look on that right now. And with the solid lines, PC, you see it split up quite happily because this is the isolated self repeat and this is what is split up. So PC contributes. And also PX, PY contributes. And this is also an explanation of why two-fold, three-fold bonding is favored more than one-fold bonding. Because PX and PY are very important. Okay? And they can uh, they have more interaction with two or three atoms than just with one. Okay? So let's summarize briefly these kind of results. Sulfur on a small radio cluster papers a two fold position. And I try to point out why this the BXUI interaction is very important. Um, in the presence of a cat eye, the people coverage configuration is paper um, and this is quite complicated because it really depends on the decrease of your repose <coughs> and the decrease in your interaction how that ratio is okay that's a complicated mechanism um, and finally your bond contracts for a two or three composition if your magnesium is, is present your sulfur comes closer to your surface this is just summarizing these uh, results. Um, finally, I want to say a few things about what Weissing is currently doing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I think that catalyst modeling is uh, currently in a position where modeling in biochemistry was about eight or eight years ago. Uh, right now, you see, if, if there is a new drug or whatever invented, a lot of the work was done with model. There's even a separate kind of lecture on modeling and drug design, I think, at the moment. So that's a really big field right now. And we think that catalyst modeling uh, will be in the same kind of position in, in a couple of years. <coughs> but the problem is that the tools you, you need, you can use for catalyst modeling, are not integrated because you have you might have a tool to calculate some friendship patterns or do some calculations or stuff like that, but they are not in an integrated tool. And what you really want to do is do one kind of simulation after the other because after you calculate the friendship pattern, you want to study absorption. Okay, so it's really a great value to integrate them in a same environment um, to make it also um, useful to a um, less skilled user than a real academic or a little or a real expert. Okay? But we admit this is it's not an easy problem. So that's why we set up a consortium. The consortium consists of the analysis team, which are eight people advising fully working on the science part and four people working on the software part. And they work in close relation with the members, uh, which are uh, companies from all over the world. And they work together with university, universities, um, consultants, and the other bodies who are your resources, because there are a lot of other projects. Uh, and one of them is just developing the potentials to do the right simulations. So, just name a few of the members. Well, just pick your favorite company. There are a lot of. Uh, a lot of companies involved in this, but also the universities. And the function of those members is to, first of course, to sponsor the development. And the second thing is they really um, have a vote in which way the direction is going, because there are member meetings, and they say, well, I'm, I'm interested in this particular part, and <coughs> they really direct directors to go in the way they want they are interested in and just keep an eye that they are doing the right things that um, the people can, can make really useful. Okay, well that's basically what I want to do.
yourself. Um, if people might see some more things, might some moving pictures instead of aesthetic slides, uh, I would really like to invite them to go to the booth, um, which is lasting till 4 o'clock or something. Today. I'm not sure when that's sometime today. Oh, just to provide a flight. I really appreciate your attention. Are there any questions? Well, the local density function is going to be much faster. Is that include electron correlation? Or is that how it uh, figure it out? That's a very good question, and it was it wasn't the formula. Um, in principle, the expression you use in local density function theory is exact. But all your ignorant, ignorance is put in long term, which is called the exchange for correlation potential. And all the different local density methods differ in the way they treat that term. And one simple approximation is saying, well, let's just do a like it's a homogeneous spectrum case. And that might sound a little weird, but it works out pretty well. Maybe due to a translation of errors. Uh, but you can also, um, there are also a lot of corrections to this potential here. Yeah. So the only improvements are made in the extra term, the exchange correlation potential. But that's a good question. Maybe you don't know what you're talking about. So, yeah. 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 the sulfur rock, how many of this ingredient is more How to decrease the affinity of sulfur rock? How to decrease the affinity of sulfur to the flat metal? Um, so the question is, how can you decrease? Yeah, decrease the affinity of sulfur. Okay, well that's, I think this, this question comes unfortunately far beyond what we study. Because we study these model systems. And it, the first thing, it depends on the, on the position of the sulfur. So, first you have to know something more about the exact um, location of these clusters in your zeolite. That, that's one thing. Um, but the other parameters of course, how big are your clusters? So it's, I don't have a, just a receipt, just put this in your zeolite and it will be better. That's, unfortunately, that's, that, that's a little bit on what we did right here. It's very fundamental. This is a question. Earlier you looked at a clustering of metals on metal oxide. Is that true? Uh -huh. so yeah. platinum. What is that interaction that you assume between the metal oxide and the metal? Is it like a polarization of the metal to interact with that oxygen? Is it a partial oxidation of the metal? Um, I don't know exact potential, the exact potential metal uh, model, but as I pointed out, but that's a complicated system because you have the ionic interactions and you have the metal-like interactions with the metal. And I think in this model, all, all those potentials are really involved. Okay. Um, so the only thing I can do is re refer you to the reference of those metals. The other question I have is once you make a biometallic cluster, there's always surface segregation of one metal and the other. Do you have your calculations take it that into effect and what type of things are you going to calculate that? Well, if, if that's true, if there is segregation to the surface, it will not, it turns out during the simulation. Um, so, I, I don't really know if there was real segregation to the surface or not. I, I can tell you. But if, it, if, if it's if it's apparent, it, it will show, it will turn out. How does it become apparent? Or what type of things you look for? Um, bond energetics. Well, you can just, or just investigate what, what the results of your simulation to see what, what's in the core and what's in the, on the surface. That's one thing. But we were, were more interested in structural things happening because of the interaction with the periodic the crystalline structure. So that's why we we calculated the pressure patterns. We were more interested in crystallinity and less in segregation of the surface. And it wasn't just a very small study. It's, it's not all these results, but just a very small uh, exercise. Okay. Well, no other questions. I'd like to thank Dr. Van Dalen for a very interesting talk.